There is a very specific way for setting up a traditional altar in the Roman Rite. And so today we're going to look at how a altar is set up properly in the Roman Rite. And we'll also look at the sacred vessels that are used during the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass and also other liturgies. Let's take a look. All right, well, the very first thing you'll notice on a traditional altar is usually they are positioned ad orientum. That is, they are oriented towards God. The east is where Christ will return. Christ says in the Gospels, as lightning flashes from east to west, so shall the return of the Son of Man be. So somehow when Christ returns, he comes from the east. And this is why early Christians always prayed to the east. They were not praying to Jerusalem. They were praying to the direction of east because that's where Christ will return. In fact, when they were baptized, they would face to the east and affirm their belief in the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. And then they would turn to the west, which signifies darkness and death, and they would renounce the devil and all of his pomps. Now, when you look at an altar, oh, and some altars are freestanding. You go to Rome, for example, St. Peter's, St. John Lateran, St. Mary Major, um, all that being said, usually, for example, St. Peter's is facing east, but the church is oriented west. So the Pope, when he celebrates mass at the high altar in St. Peter's, and traditionally there's candles and crucifix and all kinds of things there. So it's not like he's directly speaking to the people uh, in that way. In fact, uh, during the time of Gregory the Great and thereafter, there was often a curtain or screen that was brought around uh, the Pope when he celebrated Mass to provide um, more mystery and more privacy as the Pope offered the Holy Sacrifice. Now, regardless of which way the altar is facing, in the center, on the altar, not just hovering over the altar, but on the actual altar is the crucifix the crucifix. Why? Because the altar is where the cross and death of Jesus is represented in the Holy Sacrifice. So right there in front of the priest is the crucifix, and it should be facing the priest, not the other way. And then there's also this crazy abuse of putting a corpus on each side of the cross so that lady can see it in versus populum and priest can see it. That's an abuse that should never be done. In an ad orientum setup, there's a reredos, and this is, it can be fabric, it can be marble, um, it can be wood carved. This is a backdrop behind the altar, and it has sacred art on it. Sometimes they open and close. The reason for that is during Lent at Passion Tide and beyond, the statues are veiled, and, and one way they do that is they close these giant altar pieces above the altar. And it's... In the Roman Rite, custom that some great mystery of faith or saint is represented in the Reredos above the altar. You'll see this, for example, in Rome at St. Peter's. Uh, there could be the Transfiguration or a mural of St. Gregory the Great, and so on and so forth. So this is you know, the traditional way in which an altar is made magnificent. So when the people are praying during the Holy Sacrifice, when the priest is praying, uh, above them is this cloud of witnesses or this mystery of faith. Below the crucifix and right there in the center should be the tabernacle. Uh, in cathedrals, it is tradition for the tabernacle to be kept elsewhere. You see this, for example, in St. Peter's in Rome. That's not technically the cathedral. St. John Lateran is a cathedral, but there also uh, the the shrine and the and the place for praying before the blessed sacraments elsewhere. But in parishes, it's always in the middle, right there at the altar, so that the priest can bring the precious body in and out during Mass. And the altar itself is supposed to be like a tomb. Uh, the earliest Masses, the tradition was to offer Mass on the tombs of martyrs, because these martyrs, by their sacrificial offering of their life to Christ, unite to the passion of Jesus Christ. 
And so the early Christians saw the, the martyred bodies of saints to be connections to the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And this is why relics were always, either altar was built over the tomb of a saint, like St. Peter in Rome, uh, St. Paul, or they brought relics and placed them into the altar. So in the traditional Roman rite, every altar is a tomb. It has the body parts of a saint inside of it. And that's connecting our realm down here with the realm above. The, the passion and the death of saints is a participation in the passion and death of Jesus Christ. Also in the book of, of the Apocalypse, you'll see that the martyrs are held under the altar of God. So that's also showing us that even the Apocalypse in heaven, the martyrs are in and under the altar. Beautiful mystery there. Now, there on the altar, you'll also see candlesticks. Um, these are often of precious metal, and there are six of them. Six are used in high mass, two are used in low mass. We talked about that in another video. If a bishop's present, a seventh candle is brought. Sometimes these candles you'll see have relics attached to them. Uh, they're often very tall to make things dramatic, and you, of course, have to have uh, a longer stick to, to light those. Traditionally, by the way, when they're lit, and I, I see this done wrongly frequently in Catholic churches, but when candlesticks are lit, ideally you would have two altar boys come out, genuflect, and they light from the tabernacle out. You can think of like the Holy Ghost coming down and spreading out. So if the two altar boys came out, they would genuflect and they would light the two candles closest to the tabernacle and then the ones out and then the ones to the furthest out and all six would be lit. That's the proper way to do it. I don't. And then when you snuff them out, it's the exact opposite. So the altar boys would come out and it's kind of like you can think of the Holy Spirit going back up. They snuff the outside ones, the middle ones, and then the ones closest to the tabernacle. And this is just showing respect to Jesus and the tabernacle, sort of like Jesus gets served first. The, the candles closest to Jesus, right, are the first ones to be lit, and then they're also the last ones to be lit. So if you train altar boys or servers and y'all aren't doing that, make sure that you do do it. And if there's one altar boy lighting and extinguishing the candles, the rule of thumb is the same. It begins with closest to the tabernacle, but you begin on the epistle side and go inside, middle, out, genuflect on the gospel side, inside, middle, out. And then just as the mass goes from epistle to gospel to gospel, epistle at the end of mass, if there's one server, he genuflects gospel side, outside, middle, closest to the tabernacle, genuflects, and then on the epistle side, outside, middle, tabernacle. That's the proper way to do it and handle, handle the candles. Uh, on low mass, there'll be two candles lit, and sometimes altars will have the six for high mass, and they'll have two for low mass. That's very common. Uh, you'll also notice altar cards. Uh, these will be on the epistle side, the center, and the gospel side. And I haven't even mentioned the epistle and gospel side. So in the Old Testament, they refer to the four horns of the altar, uh, the horns or the corners. And you see this also in the medieval period. There's the epistle horn and the gospel horn, or the epistle corner and the gospel corner. And that's because the epistle is read on, if you're facing the altar, it's on the right side, and the gospel is read on the left side. And the mass itself moves from the epistle side to the gospel side and then back to the epistle side. That's the motion of the traditional um, mass. Also, the gospel is read to the north. The north represents the Gentiles. The south represents Israel. We'll talk about that in another video, the mystical uh, uh, mystical representation that Thomas Aquinas and others talk about in the movement around the altar and the traditional mass. So you have the altar cards there, and those are to help the priest pray the prayers that are appropriate uh, for himself. So um, there'll be the, you know, the prayers uh, relating to the offertory, the last gospel over on the epistle side, prayers related to the offertory and to the canon 
in the middle of the altar. These are sort of like cheat sheets for the priest. And it's good. We don't want priests, you know, they could be tired because they were giving extreme unction last night. Uh, they might be hungry because they've been fasting during a penitential season. Um, this might be their third or fourth mass of the day. So they they got to get everything right with their rubrics and their words. And even though they say it every day, they may be a little fatigued. Sometimes they might blank. It's great to have the cheat sheet there. And that's why the church provides them. Now, on the top of the altar is what's called the mensa, which just means tabletop. It's the tabletop. And we want to be careful with this. I, I often sometimes see lay people when they're up at the around the altar and maybe they're cleaning and they kind of just put their hand on it while they're talking. We should never do that. Um, the mensa is holy. It has five crosses carved in the top of it. And these signify the five wounds of Jesus. Right hand, left hand, right foot, left foot, and then the wound in his side. So the altar itself is not only the cross, but it's also the body of Christ symbolically. So you don't just want to go, and it's not a, a rail. It's not a resting place. You don't just put your hand on top of it or lean on the altar. Never, never. Um, there should be only the greatest care, only sacred actions, kissing the altar, etc. cetera. Uh, you also have the altar table coverings, the various linens. And the linens should hang down on the side of the altar to the floor, right? They should be long. They shouldn't be short. We should be ample. We should give the Lord our best. And they should be made out of linen, not polyester or cotton. Why? Well, poly polyester is fake. Um, linen, the way you make linen is you, you, as I understand, I might be wrong on this, but there's the beating of the reeds of it that create the fibers. And so the, the church fathers talk about how linen is formed by kind of a, a beating or a sacrifice or a ripping apart and then a bringing together. So there's this idea of passion, death, resurrection built in to linen itself. And linen is, is beautiful. It's costly. It requires extra care because it gets wrinkled. If you've ever had a pair of linen shorts or a linen shirt, you can't just pull it out of the washing machine. So it requires special care and there's a certain elegance about linen. That's why there's linen on the altar. Even the priest wears linen before he puts on his vestments, a linen alb. And I know today they use polyester and cotton, but look, traditionally it's the linen and there's a reason for that. Uh, let's see. Uh, there's a frontal on the altar. Not always, um, but commonly the altar itself is veiled because things are veiled and the tabernacle should be veiled. I didn't mention that as, as well, but a frontal hangs on either partially down the altar or all the way to the floor. And it, it covers the altar because the altar is sacred, not required, but common. And then you'll see the steps before the altar. This is very traditional. There are three steps needed. There's a step for the, there's a, priest, deacon, and subdeacon. So these are, and it's also Trinitarian. And also we go up to the altar. We don't go down. Uh, the ancient Greeks in their uh, theaters, in their drama, the people sat up in like a cone and the stage was down below. That's where the actors were. So the people were high and the actors were low, just like in a football stadium or a baseball stadium. But temples, sacred places, the people are low. And then the priests who are engaging with God are high. So we should, we should never have an auditorium style where we're looking down on the altar. And I've seen this, unfortunately. Some modern churches and in some outdoor chapels, the people are high and the altar is low. Very bad. Teaching a very, very bad lesson here. We go up on the mountain of God to the altar. So there's traditionally three steps. There's one for the priest, one for the deacon, and one for the subdeacon. That's on purpose. And then off to the side, you'll see the chairs for the priest, the deacon, and the subdeacon. They often have a, a special way for the vestments to hang off and not be damaged or crumpled or sat upon. And you'll see also the credence table. The credence table is where they keep the water and the wine and everything else, purificators, everything else necessary that shouldn't be on the altar. Often you'll see a finger basin. 
This is where a priest, if he's going to distribute communion, he can go and purify his fingers before doing so. And there's communion patent. This is the patent that they hold. The, there's one patent that they use in the Mass, but the communion patent has the handle on it, and the altar server will hold this under your, th- under your chin as you receive communion. And, of course, there is the bell, which uh, is rung at certain times, the Sanctus, 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 uh, and, and other places, uh, to signal to the congregation what's happening. Also, bells are, are just holy. And uh, they scare away demons, and they've been blessed. There's special blessings for bells. And they bring a certain uh, punctuation and elegance to the Holy Mass. And then outside all of this, you'll see the communion rail. And the communion rail is where we come to kneel. It also creates a barrier between uh, the nave, where the people are, and then the sanctuary, the holy place. So, And also there, you'll sometimes have what's called a houseling cloth which is like a, instead of having the communion pattern, there's a, a sheet of linen that comes up and you hold it under your, under your chin. And that way, if our, precious, if our precious Lord falls, he's caught there. So that's the sanctuary. And I think we'll, we'll pause here and we'll do a part two and we'll go through the various vessels uh, that are used in the mass. But that gives you an idea of the altar and how the altar is set up and the names of all the things. And then this next video, part two, will go through the vessels. Thanks for being a member of the New St. Thomas Institute and studying this history of the Roman Rite and the traditional Latin Mass. We'll see you soon in that next video. God bless. Amen.